Coming up on Tech News Today, Amazon's big announcement. Does it stun the world? We'll tell you. Also, Motorola adds more names to their phones, and mobile gamers rule. We'll tell you why next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, September 6, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to that latest iPhone at gazelle.com. And by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high-quality website or blog. Plus, more than 50 new features, including mobile responsive designs. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com. Use our offer code TNT9. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we attempt to keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting every time with the top 10 stories of the day in the news views. Amazon's Jeff Bezos took the stage in Santa Monica to announce a whole boatload of new Kindles, including a new e-ink with front light called the Kindle Paperwhite for $119. Also, a few other e-ink models. The Kindle Fireline got an upgrade with a new follow-up and upgraded version of the regular Kindle Fire. And the Kindle Fire HD line, which will be available for 7 inches and 8.9 inches at $199 and $299, respectively. And an 8.9-inch Kindle Fire HD 4G LTE, which comes built in with a really long name that you can get for $499, but also allows you 250 megabytes of LTE service a month for a yearly cost of $50. At yesterday's main event, Motorola introduced three new phones. Let me take a deep breath. <gasps> They're called the Droid Razor HD, the Droid Razor Max HD, and the Droid Razor M. And they'll all ship with Android 4.0.4 ice cream sandwich. They all use a 1.5 gigahertz dual core processor. Jelly Bean is expected before the end of the year. The Razor HD and Max HD are pretty much the same phone, 4.7 inch displays, except that the Max comes with double the storage at 32 gigabytes and a huge battery. Well, as compared to the other one. The Droid Razor M might gain a sizable following because, well, it's cheap. On contract, it's 99 bucks. comes with a 4.3-inch edge-to-edge screen and a very small form factor. It's about the size of the iPhone 4S. If you thought Facebook already owned Instagram, you were wrong Hey, until this morning. Oh. Uh, now you're right. I love being right. Both companies announced on their blogs that their beautiful union is now consummated. Instagram also took the opportunity to brag that 5 billion photos have been shared on the service. Neither company announced the purchase price, but with Facebook's falling stock price, it's estimated to be around $750 million or less. Wow, that's like nothing at all. Nothing that's such at all. a bargain. Wow, what a bummer. <laughs> Can't use $1 billion on Instagram involved. anymore. Uh, yesterday, as part of Nokia's announcement of the Lumia 920, the company released a promo video demonstrating the PureView camera. Eagle-eyed TC Sawtech from The Verge noticed a reflection of a van with a DSLR camera in the part of the video demonstrating image stabilization. Nokia posted an apology for the deception, admitted the video was not shot on a Lumia 920, and have now posted a video <laughs> that was shot on the Lumia 920. Twitter has released version 1.1 of its new and improved API that everybody loves and has updated the developer rules of the road document to reflect the changes, which includes deprecating support for RSS, XML, and Atom. Most aggregation apps can be rewritten us using Twitter's 1.1 APIs, but if developers want to get data out of Twitter, they must use OAuth. Apps that use RSS, XML, or Atom will need to shift to JSON or other API methods by March 5th, 2013. Bloomberg has a ton of details in, of Apple's foray into television. Apparently, Apple's been working on a way to find content easily since 2005. The most recent point of contention between Apple and the cable companies is UI. The cable companies do not want Apple to control the experience entirely. Bloomberg also explains how an Apple TV would work. It'd be a set-top box, and it'd pretty much follow a TiVo model. You'd pay for your cable, and you'd use Apple's box. So the Apple TV is the Apple TiVo. Did any of us think that external drives could be so eye-catching? No. I did. <gasps> 
and so did Western Digital, which announced a new line of portable external hard drives for Macs and Windows PCs called My Passport Edge. The drives are USB 3.0 and bus powered and only 9.5 millimeters thin. The 500 gigabyte version costs $110 for the plastic looking one that's formatted in NTFS and $120 for the shiny aluminum one that's formatted HFS plus. Doesn't seem so much eye catching as there's less to look at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thin is in. South Korea's antitrust watchdog says it's launched an investigation into whether Samsung is using its dominant position in the wireless market to Apple's disadvantage. Oh, those Samsung bullies. <laughs> They're leaning on their pool of third-gen wireless patents to win lawsuits against Apple. But Samsung's argument is that Apple should be denied sale of products that illegally use patents that are deemed essential tech for 3G networks and have scored just one single victory that was in a sole court, but at the same time are fueling further scrutiny from regulators on other continents. That was my favorite show in the 70s. Soul court. <laughs> <laughs> Joystick reports that MPD estimates 211.5 million people are playing games in the U.S., down 12 million from a year ago. What are they doing? Uh, bucking the trend, though, is mobile gaming, which rose 9%. Mobile gaming took a larger percentage of the gaming audience, 22%, than core gamers, which held the top spot a year ago. It's an exciting day for e-readers and tablet fans because Kobo introduced three new products. The Kobo Mini is a $79 e-reader with a 5-inch e-ink screen along with Wi-Fi for social reading. The Kobo Glow will run you $130, bucks, offers a micro SD card for, uh, slot for expansion, 6-inch touchscreen display, and has an integrated light. You know, glow, get it? Uh, there's also the Kobo Arc, a 7-inch Android-powered tablet, which will run about $200 for the 8-gigabyte model and $250 for the 16-gigabyte. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Gazelle. You want that Lumia 920? You want the new iPhone that's probably going to come out next week? You want those new Amazon products or maybe those Kobos? You need some cash. And there is no simpler or easier way to get quick cash for your old gadgets than Gazelle. Go to gazelle.com, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Uh, click on the image. It's like ordering from a really, really simple restaurant. You just click on the image of the thing you have, pick the model number, they help you by saying, like, this is what your model looks like. This is what your carrier's logo is. Uh, and then you tell them what accessories you have, what condition it is, and you will get a quote right then. Lock in that quote for 30 days. And once you get your new iPhone, ship your old one to Gazelle or whatever it is you're buying. You can, you can lock in the quote now and wait to get the gadget until it's announced. So there's no reason to delay. Go to gazelle.com, lock in that offer right now. You get paid in cash, uh, paid within a few days of the item being received at Gazelle, and the shipping is free. They pay for the shipping label. Sometimes they'll give you a box. There's no reason to delay. Go do it right now because gadgets don't get more valuable over time. They're getting less valuable every day. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Sell your used iPhone or Android phone or MacBook today. We thank Gazelle for their support of Tech News Today. All right, very happy to have Renee Ritchie, editor-in-chief of iMore.com with us. Bunch of people on Twitter like super psyched to joining us again, man. It's awesome. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Great to, great to have you along. we got some great stories to talk to Renee about. Uh, but first, we're going to play around with the timeline and tell you what Amazon announced. So let's talk about uh, these Amazon announcements. 100,000 Kindles <laughs> announced. The e-ink, uh, follow-up to Kindle Fire, and the new line of Kindle Fire HD. Uh, just running through real quickly what they announced. The Kindle Paperwhite. Right. Which we had a lot of fun with during the announcement for because that name. I thought it sounded like Paperweight. Uh, but besides the name, it's pretty great. $119. Pre-order today ships October 1st uh, with free 3G built in. But the but the biggest thing is the front light that's got a nice super white bright display. It's frontless to reduce eye strain, uh, but allow you to read in the dark. Finally, a book light on a freaking Kindle. That's not actually that little... Yeah, that's not something you had to it's hook on the It's not actually the hook the light outside. that you use. You know. Now, the paper white's actually 120 for the Wi-Fi, 180 if you want 3G built in. So that's the extra little cost to get you there. But it ships October 1st. I'm excited about this because I, I like the, I had the older Kindles. They had that black on gray look, and that's pretty good. It kind of feels like newsprint, but this is supposed to have higher contrast because it's more white, and it has a denser uh, pixels per inch, so it's got a, a denser pixel density. So I am excited about that because you can have smaller fonts, I read things on in small fonts. I like this because I don't want to be stuck with the old uh, Kindles. I'm yeah, small fonts are great as long as your contrast is high enough. Yeah. And, the and that's, is, it sounds like they're getting there. They'll be very sharp because of the amount of pixels in there. Also, another e in Kindle, the formerly known as $79 Kindle, is now known as the $69 Kindle. Uh, new fonts, crisper text, and ships starting September 14th. 
Yeah, it's a minor upgrade there. Uh, they talked a lot about Kindle Direct Publishing, including a new serials program where you pay $1.99 and you get the entire book over the course of its serialization. So you get the first episode at the beginning and then each episode until they run out of episodes, they're all appended to each other so you can read them all together at the end if you want to reread Although it, it doesn't appear that authors can change that one ninety nine price at all. So if you want for, to be part yeah. of it, that's what it is. It definitely seems like an odd entry. It just kind of reminds me of like iTunes LP. It's like, okay, well, it's a new version of uh, a new way to get content, but I don't know if this is going to be a monstrous hit or if publishers or authors will want to take advantage of something like this just seems like it's a way to do Kindle singles, but larger. Well, that's it. It's it's saying we're going to strike a place between Kindle singles and, and full-on novels and allow you to put this out. Now, uh, people have experimented this before. Stephen King did The Green Mile in paperback as a serial. Uh, John Scalzi is putting out his next book as a serial uh, starting in December uh, with Tor Books. I don't think it's part of this Kindle Direct Publishing program, but it's something authors do like to, to toy around with sometimes. They also did talk about serials after they had touted how successful authors had been on the direct publishing program. So not only do we have evidence of such, but as a potential serials author, we are already providing a really good ecosystem and a lot of people who are potentially going to buy your content. Let's get to their hottest announcements, the new Kindle Fires. Ouch. I did that on hot. purpose. Uh, they, they do a follow-up to the regular Kindle Fire, so they upgraded the hardware. That was the knock on the original Kindle Fire. It was great, but the eh, hardware was a little old. So it gets a gigabyte of RAM. That's twice the RAM. New processor. They didn't tell us which one. Longer battery life, 44% faster, they claim. You can pre-order today. Ships September 14th for 159 bucks. so it's even cheaper than the original Kindle Fire. That's a really aggressive price, and it gets the spec bumps, because I know the Kindle Fire was on sale refurb for around that same price. But at 159 if it's actually if it, it's more responsive at 44 percent faster as they're claiming that was a big knock it's a little the old fire is a little slow when you're doing uh taps on the screen if it can move faster i think they're going to sell a lot of those now the kindle fire hd uh is a better looking screen obviously uh there's a seven inch version for 16 gigabytes that's 199 dollars, and an 8.9 inch version so not quite the 10 inch version everybody was talking about for 299 dollars. 8.8 millimeters 20 ounces 254 pixels per inch 1920 by 1200 screen on that 8.9 inch uh and a polarizing filter to cut down on glare they say it should cut that glare by 25 percent these ship november 20th and you can pre-order them today as well uh tio map 4470 processor, HDMI out, Bluetooth, dual speakers. They made a big deal about how it's stereo, Dolby Digital Plus of, uh, as well. They also had a long technical discussion about the Wi-Fi. They got two antenna, uh, and they can do 2.5 or 5 gigahertz, MIMO built in, so that it can just figure out which antenna's got the strongest signal, use that signal, and adapt to whatever gigahertz your Wi-Fi is using. Yeah, Amazon unusually talking about the specs of the device because it seemed like they just wanted to play up. This is a high-end product. It has multiple antenna. It's got it's got two speakers. It, they actually explained what the processor was for once. They don't usually do that. And I, it's it's just to show you and then shock you with that price of two ninety nine because you're getting a lot of quality in that build. It's, that display is insane for two ninety nine. Now, they talked a lot about features. X-Ray is their service for giving you additional information. So X-Ray is coming to movies, integrated with IMDb, so you can click on a face, find out who that face is. Also coming uh, to textbooks, WhisperSync coming to games. But the one that got Leo standing up and cheering was WhisperSync integration between audiobooks and text. Not textbooks, but, but printed books. So you read a chapter, you got to go, then you're in your car, you pick it up where you left off, Later on, when you're reading for your half an hour before you go to sleep, you pick up where your audio uh, version of the book left off. Seamless syncing. It's great. And, and they call it an immersion reading, I think. Yeah. The thing yep. is, they didn't announce pricing plans. I was, I was kind of curious about if you're buying a book that has the text version and yeah, you're you don't want to buy two versions yeah. of the book just for the convenience. Right. Is there a bundle? Is there like a discount if I buy them they together? Didn't mention I'm very that. Well, and audiobooks from Audible generally are very expensive unless you're an Audible member mm -hmm. and you're using your credits. So I'd, I'd be curious what these immersion versions are priced <laughs> as well. But I love this idea. I absolutely have been dying for Whisper Sync on audiobooks and then just throwing in the facts that it's going to sync with your print as well. It, you've, you've totally sold me there. Uh, also, something called Kindle Free Time, some parental control. Turns blue so you can tell that it's on, so you can look across the room and say, okay, yeah, they're, they're, on, their, they're on their parental control. It's okay to let them play with it. Multiple profiles available as well. That's kind of cool. But the big news, 
Kindle Fire HD 4G LTE. Big as in a really <laughs> long name. Uh, but they made a big deal about how this is $200 more than the other 8.9 inch because it has LTE. So the regular 8.9 inch with Wi-Fi is $299. The Kindle Fire HD with LTE is $499, but it's 32 gigabytes of storage. And it's only $50 per year for that LTE service. For a cap of 250 megabytes per month. Yes. For data. Correct. Now, when you have LTE, With LTE you it's go so through data that hungry, faster. Yes. You're not going to be streaming a lot of movies over the LTE. It's I think it's meant as a supplement. They're essentially saying, if you spent $299, you're going to get a Kindle Fire HD that you would use on Wi-Fi all the time. So for an extra $200 and a $50 subscription per year, you're going to have a little stopgap. Mm -hmm. uh, where when you're out at the park or you're away from your house and you need to do a quick check on something, you've got 250 megabytes to yeah, spend. Yeah, but what if you're away from your Wi-Fi and you need to do some movie watching? You yeah, know, yeah you're on a train, got, you want Amazon. You've got a Fire HD. You're going to have to have downloaded device. that to the 32 gigabytes yeah. on, the, on the local They actually storage, did bother to increase the storage because the old Fire had 8 gigabytes. They probably, I'm, I'm sure there'll be like a warning that pops up that says, you sure you want to watch video? This is, you're going to get about yeah. three minutes of it. That's all you're going to get. <laughs> uh, but I'm, 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 I'm wondering if there's going to be more plans as well. But it's a very, it's, it's aggressive to do that. But Amazon said they engineered a 2.2 millimeter sized uh, modem. Maybe if they made it a little fatter, it could have been a little cheaper. Also, uh, not one, not two, but several of their slides at the announcement was direct specs as compared to the iPad 3, the new iPad, um, showing off how much cheaper, obviously. The, all in uh, all, Kindle Fire HD is. little disappointed that we didn't see like a real crazy announcement like a cell phone or a streaming box or a new streaming service, but a, str a strong lineup, I thought. It puts Amazon in a really strong position for the holiday season. They have everything coming up by November, if not earlier. And that cheap $69 Kindle, I mean, when it was $79, people were buying the stocking stuffers already. Now it's going to be everywhere. The only model I don't really see selling that well is that uh, original Kindle Fire that got a spec bump and got, what, $40 slashed off its price. For another, what, $50 now, you can go up to the HD Fire. I don't know. It just seems like a middle-of-the-road model that they just they just didn't want to take off the market completely. Yeah, 159 is like an iPod Touch competitor at that price. You just give it to somebody. Like, here, just play with this all you want. I don't care if you break it at that that cost. <laughs> 159 is really cheap. I mean, the other thing is when the refurb models come out in a couple of months, it's going to be down to like 139. One, I mean, it's gonna, it's, that's a really aggressive price. I guess what I mean is the 7-inch Kindle Fire HD at 199 also sounds really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a two hundred dollar bump for the four ninety nine with LTE. That's the one that I'm kind of like biting my lip on. With the with the two hundred and fifty meg limit, you're really spending two hundred dollars more for the device and fifty dollars a year. Is it? Yes, fifty dollars a year, so you can check your email when you're not at home. You know what I mean? Like that's that's a lot to spend for that minor convenience. The things that you're going to want to do with that larger media consumption device, you kind of can't do because the cap's going to get in the way. Uh, let's bring uh, Renee back in the conversation and uh, talk about Motorola's new phones. They announced yesterday afternoon the new M Motorola Droid Razor HD family. Uh, shipping with ice cream sandwich in time for the holidays. They do promise they'll upgrade them to Jelly Bean by the end of 2012. The Droid Razor HD, sort of the flagship one, 4.7 inch screen, 2,500 milliamp hour battery uh, with 16 hours of talk time. Then there's the Droid Razor Max HD, which is basically the same phone, but with 21 hours of talk time. I, n I never understand why they don't make a bigger deal out of the Max. It's just a little heavier. Like that should be the cooler phone, right? Because it's got more battery life. Right. And then uh, the Droid Razor M, actually available very soon. You can pre-order it now. Uh, $99 for a two-year contract, or you can pre-order the developer edition for $550, and they promise it'll start shipping the week of September 13. That one comes with an unlocked bootloader so that you can mess with it. Uh, that, the Droid Razor M is very interesting. 4.3-inch screen, but squeezed into a very small form factor, so there's almost no bezel uh, next to that QHD screen, 2,000 milliamp hour battery, so you know not greatly impressive, but it's all right. 1.5 gigahertz dual core processor, giga RAM, 8 giga storage, LTE, 1080p video recording, and uh, PocketLint reports that the Razer M will actually be the same design for the Intel phone that Motorola is supposedly going to come out with soon. Yes, and it's going to ship with ice cream sandwich, even though Google owns the company and didn't bother to give them 
what jelly beans. They bean? said they would not give them special treatment. Well, they, this it's seems to be definitely what's happening. Not even special. This is like being. This is a penalty for being Google subsidiary at this point because Google can't show any favoritism whatsoever. So they can't sh ship with jelly bean. It just seems like it's that same Motorola experience that we saw last year. It's a, it's a nice re revision to the whole lineup, but. If you want to stand out, this is not a product that's going to stand out necessarily because Samsung's got the S3. This looks great and everything. It's got the same, effectively the same processor, but it, so it you're could blaming, be more. You're blaming Google for like maybe with or withholding or not helping Motorola. I think it's Motorola saying we want to put what a, what is it? TouchWiz is that <laughs> their blur? blur. 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 I can never, they don't blur call it blur anymore. anymore. They, yeah. they put their own interface on right. it though. It's not stock. Right. And so right. to do that, that's probably, in my, my estimation, what's holding it up is they haven't figured out how to put that and pollute Jelly Bean with it. Well, they said these phones will be upgraded to Jelly Bean by the end of the year. Yeah. So it's just anno ice cream sandwich yeah. in time for the holidays. I mean, I think if anything, maybe somebody gets a new phone as a gift and they say, okay, great. I've learned how it works and then I'm going to get upgraded and maybe that could be a little bit confusing. But you figure it's confusion for the good because they're getting the better operating system. It doesn't sound like Jelly Bean maybe someday. It's maybe within a couple of months. Well, I would hope any manufacturer that's rolling out an ice cream sandwich device right now can guarantee that Jelly Bean's coming. If they can't even do one revision, then that's ridiculous. You know, one upgrade to the next OS. So they made a huge deal about Jelly Bean in the presentation before they even unveiled these phones, you know, about how we're buckling down on Jelly Bean. And then they released the phones with Ice Cream Sandwich with an eventual update to Jelly Bean. It just kind of left a sour taste in my mouth. And I, I was on kind of some of the social networks yesterday kind of complaining about that and got a lot of pushback from people saying, hey, Moto you know, Google's only owned Motorola for three months. You can't expect this giant ship to turn so quickly. But I think perception is reality in a, in a lot of cases. And whether, whether Motorola isn't Google's official hardware division, it, they're seen as that now. And this is kind of the first version of that. And already it feels like they're behind the ball, even though they're a part of Google. And they did know? start the announcement with Eric Schmidt on stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Renee, what did you make of, a, of these three phones? I, I thought this was a very odd announcement. I have half I have half a mind that as soon as media broke word about the September 12th Apple event, a lot of companies rushed to get yeah. their announcements out ahead of time just so they could serve as B-roll for when people cover Apple next week. And I, I don't think it did them any favors because they didn't have pricing or launch information available for the for the Max or the for, for the HD or the HD Max only for the M. Uh, and the, like you said, there's no there's ice cream sandwich, there's no jelly bean. And if you want to talk about a differentiated UI, what they showed off of the interface for these devices was was not very user friendly. It looked a bit like a mess. Uh, and usually like Samsung will make their interfaces simpler for mainstream users, where this was very complicated, very colorful, almost garish. Uh, and I, I really don't think they did themselves any favors with this announcement, you know, forcing it to be yesterday. That I weather app is... makes me think of J.J. Abrams, like it's a lens flare. <laughs> <laughs> the sun is a lens flare, yeah. I think Renee's totally right. A lot of uh, companies know that Apple dominates September. So now September turns into, it's the iPhone announcement, but when all the companies come out with new and cool things, whether they're new and cool is a bit of a stretch. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about these phones and the, how hard it's going to be to get the carriers to test Jelly Bean up with this and how the manufacturers got to test it. The fact that they announced that it's going to come in with a revision eventually. That's, that's the thing. Once you start adding middlemen like carriers, it could take a lot longer to get something you should have Didn't on they this. make a big deal about this whole program where they're going to get the carriers? The, the, oh, the 18-month thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that really took is, off. That's supposed to oh, yeah, get rid of that. Revolution has Android. That's why they're all in 4.1 right now. <laughs> it yeah it didn't it wasn't as uh, sticky as they hoped it would be yeah mm -hmm. sticky jelly beans leave a sour <laughs> taste in your mouth that's what's going on here <laughs> uh, speaking of sour taste also, oh go ahead Renee no I was gonna say I also thought it was kind of confusing that they went with the HD and the HD Max they could have arguably just made one phone out of that with yeah. a, a really good battery life and this just kind of splits their market I totally I've also heard uh, from people that were at the event that. Uh, the difference in like just in the size of the phone was negligible between the Max yeah. and the Razor. So it's kind of like, well, why not combine it into one device? They're all Razors. You mean the M? I mean, they're, no, the Razor oh, uh, the, HD the, the regular, and the Razor you know, Max the non -Max HD. The Max, like they're yeah. very, very close in size. Why not just make them the same thing? I have to say, I, I'm tempted by the Razor M. That's, uh, it's not the, the best specs in the world. Yeah. Uh, but, it's a solid. but for unlocked, $549 is not bad. And, and for $99, with a contract, it's it's a decent price.
these aren't bad phones. They're just not amazing phones. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then Does everything I, have to be amazing? I don't, Come I don't on, know. People. Give Motorola I, a break. I guess when you're <laughs> doing what you were talking about, Renee, which is mo potentially moving up your announcement to battle kind of the elephant in the room, which is you know, the iPhone, then yeah, it kind of does have to be amazing in comparison. All I right. had the unrealistic expectation of getting a Motorola Nexus and I would still, I still love to see that. But Absolutely. I think when they use terms like edge to edge glass, you really have to have a Tony Stark or avatar display because the words sound great, but the yes. phones were kind yeah. of pedestrian. They did have Kevlar in the back. I'll give them that. Yes. Uh, Twitter is leaving a sour taste in everyone's mouth these days, and today is the day that they're changing the API, right? Yeah, well, there's there's more information about how it's going to change. A couple days ago, we were talking about app.net and what app.net needs in order to get the masses to use the service, which, of course, is supposed to be the Twitter competitor that's not built on advertising and the needs of, of advertisers, but the users. And, and this is the sort of thing um, that is is designed to make app.net stronger. So Twitter is rolling out version 1.1 of its API, um, and they have announced they are ending support for RSS, XML, and Atom. Now, these are a variety of, of, of feeds that, that third-party apps can pull from that can include text and audio and video, a variety of types of media. So, for example, if you used to use FriendFeed back in the day, you FriendFeed pulled from Twitter's RSS in order to be able to display uh, your tweets over there. FriendFeed was bought by Facebook in 2009. But it was a very good example of a service that worked really well by using those RSS feeds of tweets. Something like a, a variety of tweets or your latest tweets in a blog widget, for example, might take advantage of the same kind of thing. Now you might say, oh my gosh, you know, widgets aren't going to work anymore. Twitter's shutting all of that down. No, not necessarily. Most of these aggregation apps can be rewritten and Twitter's uh, new API uh, has, has steps to do so. But they have to be rewritten re uh, in different languages. They have to use authentication uh, using OAuth 1.0a for all endpoints. Some apps are already using this, so it's not a big deal. Others are going to have to make that change by March of next year. What's interesting is that Twitter hasn't really said what will happen if you're just late or, you know, you're not really on the ball or you flat out refuse. I'm almost certain that whatever I set up to send my Twitter post to Facebook five years ago uses RSS. So I'm curious if that stops working for me soon. Either it stops work. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's unclear um, as to how much Twitter is going to reach out to each of these apps. It probably just depends on how many users have synced up stuff like that, right? If there's if there's some mm -hmm. sort of Facebook app that you're using that's helping you publish tweets over on your Facebook page, for example, and enough other people are using it, maybe that's something that Twitter can try to work out with them to make sure that the transition is seamless. But it is still happening. Uh, you know, developers have said this is... Uh, we're scared. They're changing their our, their API. They are pulling functionality that are built into some of our apps. We have a lot of users. And we're just now seeing, and we're going to continue to see Twitter saying, okay, well, we said that there's going to be more coming. Here's here's the next phase in us controlling the experience. It's not that they don't, it's not that Twitter doesn't want tweets to be displayed on your blog as a widget, but they want to have better control over the way those look, the way those link back, the functionality, and so on and so on. Um, speaking of third-party apps uh, that pull from Twitter's API, Hootsuite uh, is one of the few companies that have said, yeah, you know, we're we're in the good quadrant as far as Twitter's API is concerned. They have these quadrants that, you know, sort of like, if you're this kind of company, you're good. If you're this kind of company, we suggest you change your business plan. Um, Hootsuite just bought Seismic, actually. Uh, both of the companies have a variety of business users. Hootsuite says... They have about four and a half million business users, so those are paying users. Uh, they don't disclose how many of them are actually paying. Seismic also has business users too, which is why Hootsuite uh, bought them. Uh, Seismic actually does have uh, a good amount of consumer users as well, and it sounds like the Hootsuite folks, uh, once the acquisition goes through, is sort of like, yeah, that's not really what the business uh, plan is for those consumers going forward. It's it's uh, money-making stuff. But Ryan Holmes, who's the Hootsuite CEO, has said uh, of this whole Twitter API kerfuffle, we think of ourselves as a social media Switzerland. We sit between Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn, and 30 other social networks. And I don't think we'll see those social media properties butt up against what we're doing because they don't really want to acknowledge the existence of the others.
which is kind of a funny point. So yeah, Hootsuite seems to have worked out a way for Twitter not to consider it as too much of a threat because it's not building too much of a business model off of Twitter exclusively, even though it's making money. Yeah, I think Twitter was saying something like, we don't want any other company uh, copying our core functionality, very similar language to Apple. Uh, and Hootsuite doesn't work anything like that. I mean, it, you have a lot of uh, control over Twitter accounts and you can you can do timed things and you can have shared accounts. There's so many different things that Hootsuite does that, uh, that Twitter normally doesn't. So I think that's probably another reason why they're in the clear and always okay with Twitter. But just seeing these uh, the, the changes again back to the API, these seem like th this is going to weed out some of the, um, I don't want to say lazier programmers, but like these using RSS, XML, and Atom, this is really easy. You can mess with like something like Yahoo Pipes or you can use anything to create another feed or even a little widget or app and it seems like it's going to weed out some of these people who don't want to reprogram and want to learn something new so there'll be even less options for a third-party experience with twitter and i was i was thinking about that facebook thing you were talking about tom and twitter does have its own version of that inside their own web interface so like they want to control everything they want to make sure that you're always going to twitter.com and going to your settings into there and not getting used to the third parties which i thought at this point they were there some of the third parties were doing a way better job than Twitter was in some features. And so uh, we're gonna have this nice, controlled, clean experience from Twitter. Yeah, it starts to remind me of DRM, which is trying to fake something to enforce it to happen that, that should, should not happen. It, it's natural for public Twitter posts that are available for anyone to look at on the web to be available in RSS. You know, and the fact that people can take that and use that in ways, that's the way the web works. And it, it feels to me a little like Twitter's starting to go down the road of, well, we don't like the way the web works. We would like it to work differently. So we're going to try to lock it up and hide it away. And I, I, I think that's the wrong way to go. I'm not saying that this is going to ruin Twitter and people are going to stop using it. I mean, they are providing other ways in the API for this to happen. But I I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure that I think this is a good idea for Twitter long term to control too much uh when you control everything you have to do everything right uh when you allow things to be open you can sort of let some things happen naturally that you could never predict uh that benefit you and that's how twitter built its business now they're saying well now that we're popular enough we don't need to do that anymore and uh, that that always bugs me but it always happens as as mm -hmm. the temptation is always there anyway as companies get bigger and bigger renee what what do you think of this especially the hootsuite ac acquisition yeah well I mean, it's, it's like they built the garden and now are adding the wall, or it's like they got these developers to help them put their way through college, and then the minute they graduate, they're dumping them for a more attractive business model. Um, and it's kind of hard to reconcile because Facebook and Apple have always been the way they've always been, but Twitter really seemed like a grassroots, user-friendly, developer-friendly environment, and it really does feel like the rules have changed. And now they still want things that put value into Twitter, like the Instagrams and and the the business analytics stuff, but they don't want anything to pull value out again, like uh, third-party clients. And if you look at the very business school quadrants that they made, the stuff that's forbidden is the stuff that's engaging to consumers, which is a really odd choice. You can be engaging and you can you know talk to consumers, but you can't engage them. They want the business analytics. They want the, the media content. And with Hootsuite and uh, Seismic, um, Seismic really didn't have much place to go. A lot of developers have taken to their blogs to beg people who no longer use their apps to go into Twitter and revoke uh, access so they can resell that token to a new user because their business is now on a fixed model. And I, I, that doesn't seem like a very stress-free way to, to go for me. So this was probably a better deal for Seismic. Um, Hootsuite gets whatever user base they had and they get to be in a happier, at least a happier for Twitter environment. Yeah. It, it reminds me of uh, the story of, uh, you know, the grad student whose uh, girlfriend or boyfriend puts them through college and then they break up as soon as they get their degree. Yeah, <laughs> that's, it's, it's pretty much what you're describing there with Twitter. It's interesting. All right, let's take a break and thank our other sponsor, the new Squarespace.com. Faster and easier than ever to create a high-quality website or blog. Squarespace launched a new content management system, Squarespace 6, HTML5, CSS3, new faster, sleeker JavaScript foundations, uh, and it just makes it easier for you. Now, if you're a coder, you can still get under the hood and tweak it to your heart's content, but you don't have to. If you're either, like me, lazy or just not really knowledgeable and not interested in getting up to speed on the, on the actual code, Squarespace makes it easier than ever with a drag and drop experience with all kinds of new templates that are fantastic looking. You can have a professional website up in minutes. And it's going to look professional. It's going to look great on whatever platform you've got. They actually resize the images many times. Uh, so it looks great on your tablet. It looks good on your phone. Whatever people are looking at, your, your website's going to look pro. 
and you don't have to do a thing yet. In fact, go try it out right now. You don't even have to give them a credit card. Just go to squarespace.com, sign up. If you've been hearing us talk about it and you're like, well, I don't know, just do it. Just go give it a shot. It takes you a few minutes. You can have a great looking website up in, in minutes. And, uh, and once, once you start playing around with this, I think you're going to like it. If you do decide to purchase the service, you'll get 10% off on new accounts when you use the offer code TNT9. Don't forget that offer code, TNT9. New Squarespace accounts get 10% off. If you go monthly, it'll be 10% off your first month. Or if you go yearly, you get 10% off the entire year. And yearly plans come with a free domain name. So go check it out. Like I said, uh, squarespace.com. Don't even have to give them a credit card to start it off. And just try it out. We thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. All right. Uh, more bad news for folks who were hoping for an Apple TV by the end of this year. Yeah, I saw this Bloomberg story and I was like, oh, great. The Apple TV is not coming out. It's the same old story we've seen. But the thing is, this Bloomberg report had so many more details than I had seen previously. And the, the big stumbling block right now, as I mentioned in News is that the cable companies want some control over the UI. They don't want Apple controlling the entire experience. However, Apple apparently is currently uh, in in talks with Time Warner Cable, and they're furthest along with this company, and they could uh, be part of a regional rollout of Apple Television set-top boxes because Time Warner Cable is like the most amenable company when it comes to letting another company control the UI. It seems like Comcast had an issue. That's interesting. And there was also some historical uh, facts in here or, or sources to say that a deal pre-2007 with Comcast fell apart because Comcast wouldn't let Apple control the experience. Once again, apparently the cable companies just want to make sure they have some kind of uh, hands in the UI. Uh, this has been going on since 2005. And currently, what Apple's trying to do, it seems like they're trying to be TiVo. Uh, they they would set up uh, access to live broadcasting without getting new content deals. So they would have a box that would connect to cable. You still pay a cable bill. You still have access to, to everything you normally do. It's just that you have Apple's uh, box in there. You might be able to lease the boxes through cable companies. And Apple's obviously trying to get more deals so they can have on-demand content on top of that. Because otherwise, it's really not that different than a TiVo or a, a set-top box. But I'm, what I'm just, just, like, just astonished by is if UI is the stumbling block, this is the thing that cable companies are afraid of. Should cable companies be afraid that Apple controlled the UI of a set-top box at all? Well, I mean, if it, let's use Comcast as, a, as an example, right? Because that would be the cable network that, that's the one that I used to use. So that's what I would ha have at my house. Horrible UI. Um, as far as flipping through channels, set-top boxes, ugly, etc. So, sure, I'd like it to be maybe a nicer UI that Apple makes that looks a little slicker, works a little bit more like an Apple TV. But Comcast wouldn't want that because it strips out their branding. I mean, even if I don't like the Comcast name, I still see more of it if I'm using their set-top box. Yeah, but what difference does it make? I mean, like, the thing is, if, if electricity is coming to your house, do you care what the company's called? It's like, they get paid anyway. That's what Comcast doesn't want to be. They don't want to be the electric company. They right. don't dumb want to pipe. be the water company. They don't want to be a dumb pipe. For me, it's, I mean, my scientific Atlanta box, I from 2007 till today, I've gone from a Trio 680, 650 or 680 to an iPhone 4S. My scientific Atlanta cable company box is exactly the same. It has been frozen in time for 10 years. They have not innovated. They have not added value. They have not increased user experience at all. Because they have a monopoly, it's a completely closed environment. They don't have to. Um, I think Steve Jobs described it incredibly well when he did, I think it was D7 or D8, and he explained you know, how hard it was to get a phone past the carriers and how much worse it is when you have to deal with small regional cable companies, especially on a world level, just even outside the U.S. It's, it's a complete nightmare. And Apple, they have a television, they have it in the labs, they've been working on it for years, but it's the go-to-market for it. There's the way of, Apple likes to deal with consumers, not with intermediaries, and they're being forced to deal with every content owner and cable provider imaginable for this deal. So it looks like they're doing a series of collapsing compromises. And in the end, I don't know if it'll be an Apple product that I'll actually want to own. I mean, there have been a number of other third-party set-top boxes out there. TiVo is a good example. Replay TV, that died a pretty horrible death. A bunch of these devices are out there. They just never seem to take off because it does require quite the investment from, from a user perspective. Usually they work with cable cards, which is something cable companies, I heard they're doing a lot better now. But back when I was trying to use it, they would, they would just deny it existed, which I thought was a really strange thing. But if Apple went with the TiVo model, where you had to buy a set-top box from them, and if you're still paying a cable bill, do you think they would have more success than a company like TiVo? Well, but the thing is, that's not what Apple wants to do from the, the little mm -hmm. things that I've gleaned, right? They don't want to have the experience outside the cable companies because they want to do so much integration. Uh, everything I've read says they want to eliminate the distinction between live and recorded. 
so that you just pick what you want to watch. And to do that, they have to integrate closer with the cable companies, I'm guessing, uh, which is why they're bending over backwards. Otherwise, I think they would have come out with something like that, which in, in some ways is what they've come out with, with the Apple TV. But they're saying, we're not going to be a DVR for that. We, we want to do something better than a DVR, and we need the cable companies and the satellite companies to cooperate. And, and the cable companies and the satellite companies are all making a lot of money off of their interface right now. They may have horrible interfaces, but they have all kinds of advertisements in there. They have all kinds of special promotions that they give to the partner channels. Uh, they have their branding all over the place. They sell games on the DirecTV box. They, 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 they promote all of their on-demand things that they charge for there. And that, I bet, is the big sticking point, is Apple's coming in and saying, look, we'll do a 30-70 split. On, on everything, you'll get some money uh, and, and we'll control the interface and the cable companies, they, they can't wean themselves off of that. They're like, no, we want to control the interface. We want to make the deals and we want to keep all the money we make off those deals. And Bloomberg also had a historical point about Steve Jobs saying that we need more content deals before we go ahead with this because otherwise it, we need Apple to be disruptive in the field. They don't want to just show up with the set. They don't want to be TiVo and be like, yeah, we have a box. Yeah. Yay. That's why they keep calling the Apple TV a hobby. But they want to be disruptive, and to get that disruptive uh, impact seems like it's going to take a really long time to keep, you know, twisting the arms of all these companies. They and I don't know if they can ever do it. They just need one, and the Can't rest will follow. Can't they just buy one? Like <laughs> they could. Can't couple. they just buy? Just buy dish. <laughs> like, buy on. dish and do whatever you want. You've got the cash. But then they get all the FCC regulation that That's goes with true. it. That's true, yeah. I, they've it's probably a, thought long and hard about this and have a really good reason <laughs> why they haven't bought this yet. It's also I, a battle. I mean, if you make the TV, you have your input zero. Whoever makes the TV has control of the first user experience. Then input one is usually your cable or satellite, and that controls your content experience. And anything now like Apple TV or Xbox is input three or four at best. Uh, and that's not, I mean, Apple wants to sell hundreds of millions of these things, and it's got to be able to do it at a massive scale. And even if you have a U.S. cable box solution, if someone in the U.K. wants to buy that, what kind of card do they stick in there? Yeah. It's, it's a non-trivial problem for them to fix. Apple wants to be input on everything is yes. exactly what they want. Input prime. <laughs> input prime. Uh, Marissa Meyer is prime at Yahoo. Yeah. We haven't talked about Meyer. And What's up with her? Well, you know, so... Have we given her enough time to turn that company around? <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything is coming up roses. Uh, no, uh, Marissa Meyer um, has a little bit more of a of a direction, at least that the company is sharing uh, with all of us. Right Media is uh, Yahoo's ad exchange. Um, they had about 20%, but they ended up purchasing it outright um, for about $680 million in 2007. That was under former CEO Terry Semmel. So at this point, for a while now, at least in the ad tech world, there have been mumblings and grumblings that Right Media was a very expensive buy for Yahoo and wasn't actually up to snuff, at least as compared to competitor exchanges from Google. AppNexus was another. Um, if you're confused as to what Right Media actually does, it's it's Yahoo's online ad exchange. So it's sort of the stock market based model of site publishers and networks all putting inventory into a big exchange and then they can buy each other's inventory based on impressions that they all need to fulfill advertising requests. So Yahoo does this, Google does this, Facebook, et cetera. Um, uh, in a telephone interview that Meyer was not on herself, uh, but uh, Brian Silver, who is Right Media's chief, and Michael Barrett, who is Yahoo's chief revenue officer, uh, were both on the call and said, uh, not only is Yahoo committed to Right Media, but is going to invest um, several more. I think it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars into Right Media because they believe that having uh, a robust exchange is very important for Yahoo. Um, it's interesting, too, uh, that um, Michael Barrett was hired under interim CEO Ross Levinson, who has since departed, and has made it clear that he is not leaving the company. So um, at least some of uh, Levinson's hires are not only staying on because Meyer believes in them, but are staying on because they believe in the direction, one would hope anyway. So... Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a little bit of a, a clue into where Meyer is going. It, it makes sense to me based on all of her experience that she must have had from Google and online uh, advertising exchanges there and how things uh, work as seamlessly as possible to try to get what sounds like is a, uh, a, a bit of a... Well, the business isn't going that well under Yahoo at this point, but maybe because... 
it's been a little bit neglected. They don't have the infrastructure there. They need to hire uh, more of the right people, which they have said that they're going to do, at least the folks on the right media side. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I, isn't Marissa Meyer a product person? Isn't that the 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 wrap on her? So where, yes. how does that fit into to that idea? Because this isn't a product. This is the way you fund the product. Well, I mean, doesn't aren't you? Didn't you just answer the question? You make you need to make sure that you fund the products that you're working on. But that's what the Ross Levinsons and and previous people have been saying. And Marissa is like, no, we focus on users. We focus on product. Is this her way of saying I'm not going to worry about this because I got a good person in charge of it? Well, I think it's I think it's a I believe in the people in charge of it. We need to invest more money into this uh, in, into this uh, this business that we own that we paid a lot of money for. Uh, we can run this more efficiently, and it can make Yahoo money as we continue to uh, innovate down the road. See, I thought Levinson was more about media. Like he wanted to make sure that Yahoo had a ton of content, and that's when the like kind of that AOL kind of model mm -hmm. of let's become the content everyone sees. And Meyer looks like, look, she's not going to be doing that. It's going to be about, I mean, I think the Wall Street Journal article a while ago talked about what initiative she's talking about, like search being important. Like, I mean, and, and having the search results presented in a way that's different from Google and Bing, even though Bing does power their search, Yahoo controls that. And if they're going to fund all of these products, like you guys were saying, they need, they need something. And if advertising is the way to do it, it works for Google. I mean, it has to, it, it has to work for Yahoo because if they want to survive, they need to have a nice revenue stream. Renee, what do you think? Uh, you got any opinions on on Marissa and what she's been doing? Yeah, I, I think Yahoo's biggest challenge over the last few years is their utter inability to tell a cogent story to consumers. They had several beloved properties, you know, probably most of all Flickr, and they they did not know what to do with it. They don't know how to present Yahoo to customers, and I think that's one of Marissa Mayer's strengths. Uh, when when she was strong at Google, Google was also a very at very clear product-centric goals. And if she can bring that back to Yahoo and maybe polish it up a little bit and simplify it and make it more understandable, uh, I think that'll be a huge plus for Yahoo. All right, let's finish up with those MPD numbers we mentioned in the news fuse. Uh, mobile gaming now surpassing core gaming, which is your typical console, hardcore, first-person shooter stuff. And depending on the headlines, it's either the death of the console or it's just mobile gaming's taking off. It's really not that huge a, a dip. It's 5% less than last year. 211.5 million uh, video game players out there. Last year, that was around 223 million. Uh, mobile gamers are now 22% of all gamers. That's up 9% from last year. And the other growth area was digital gamers, at least that's what NPD calls it. These are people who, who get games via free and paid downloads. That's up 4%. That's now 16% of all gamers. Every other, every other uh, category was down, including the console gamers, down 2%. Now it's only 21%. So 22% is mobile, 21% console. Uh, it's, it, is, is this just is this a slight, this slight decline in console games? Is this just console fatigue? Because, I mean, these things have been out for like seven or eight years it's really, it seems like a lot of the, the console makers are more concerned about making that box the everything box in your living room. Are they not giving gamers enough? Maybe they're giving gamers too much. They, they, they're spending more time uh, playing around with the television streaming and the music features, possibly, and, and playing fewer games. I don't know. I'm really surprised that there are 12 million fewer games gamers than a year ago. It doesn't surprise me that mobile is gaining because that, that's a growth market. People are playing on their phones, playing on their tablets all the time. I, I do wonder if it's just an economic thing. Uh, people are saving money, and they're just not buying as many games. Hey, Renee, do you think that the second screen systems that uh, like that Nintendo's working on, and uh, Sony's obviously showed this off with, with their PlayStation Vita, you can actually control your PS3, and Smart Glass for Xbox, do you think that marrying that second screen, the mobile gaming side, with that console thing will help bring back console gamers? Yeah, I think they have a huge challenge. I think it's very similar to cameras. When you talk about the best cameras, the one you have with you, and why mobile cameras are succeeding, even though the picture quality, I mean, maybe the Lumia 920 aside is not, you know, top-end camera quality. It's just so convenient. And I think it's the same with mobile. If you already have a phone that has games on it, you're much more likely to just use that than worry about a console. And a lot of people I know who used to game on an Xbox or a PS3, that took over their entire television. And now they have a television show or a movie playing while they're gaming on their iPhone or their iPad or their Android device. And the second screen isn't working in conjunction with um, the main screen. It's almost like you're doing two things at once. And I think that's the value that they're missing there. All right, uh, let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. This just made me laugh and cry a little bit when I saw it today. Microsoft launching a blind taste test. It's kind of like the old Coke Pepsi challenge. Uh, you go on to 
bingiton.com. <laughs> I am not kidding. That's what it's called. Bing It On uh, allows you to do a blind search. So you, you type in your search uh, term, you press search, and then it will load up side by side the results from Bing and the results from Google without branding. The branding stripped away, so you can't tell which is which. Now, frankly, I've used both of these enough. I can sort of tell mm -hmm. yeah. which one's which when I bring them up. But, but the idea is that you're not supposed to know and that you, you pick which results were the most helpful uh, and rate that. And you do like five rounds of this, and then they'll tell you who won. And they say two to one ratio, people are picking the Bing results over the Google results. Is that kind of like the Pepsi challenge, though? I mean, Pepsi was a sweeter drink, and almost everybody would like it immediately first more. But over time, because Coke wasn't as sweet, they would drink more of it. Uh, and I'm not sure these always work. I mean, you get a good impression of Bing, but it has to be those consistent results over time, predictable, giving you what you expect. So I think it's, it's a double-edged sword when you do these kinds of things. That's a really good point, because uh, when I go to this, I have to come up with things to search, right? Mm -hmm. There are five to come up with five things to search right away. And so I'm not going to do the searches I would be doing in the normal course of my day. I really like the interface of Bing It On. This is a much more fun-looking thing. It looks like, it looks like it's a, a fight. It's a better search Yeah, engine. I'm just looking at this, and then there's two search results left and right. This is good. I don't have to keep going to two different sites. <laughs> I, I smell startup. Pile. Maybe this yeah, You we'll get the best search, of both worlds. Like search.com, <laughs> the old days where you have a ton of them at once. Like, yeah, let's, let's go back to this. I'd go to use Bing It On for, for lots of things. I like having the dual results because why not? It's going to make it your, your default That's search my default. engine is Bing It On. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, Bing could strike a revenue share deal with Google. <laughs> Let's move on to the calendar. Let's. Uh, don't forget Nokia World is still happening through tomorrow. They're promising something else amazing. The Samsung Galaxy S Relay 4G is going to hit T-Mobile in the coming weeks. Wondering how much that 84-inch Sony 4K XBR 84X900 that was announced at IFA last week is shipping for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. twenty-five thousand dollars. Totally doable. Is that U.S. And you can get it in November. <laughs> yes, that's U.S. Oh, twenty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, tiny plasma used to say. cost that. We're making progress. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's nothing. It's four K. You can afford it. Um, and if you're in London next week during the Apple announcement, and you want to be among the people who understand the things likely to come out of your mouth. The London Mac user group has hired the historic George Inn, and they're going to be covering the Apple keynote from the pub, showing live news, blogs, and stuff like that on three big screens. Ewan Rankin from Vertish Tech Mac. British Tech Mac. Sorry, oh, that's British. Book. Vertish. <laughs> I've, I'm reading this for the first time, obviously. It says that Twitch live stream will be on one of the screens. Yay, that's kind of fun. The event is free and starts at 5.30 p.m. UK time and is open to all. All right, let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Got an email from Rob in Vancouver, British Columbia, home of the Champion Lions, and says, As someone who had three iPhones over the years and went Android when the Samsung Galaxy Note came out, I have my two cents to add as to why an Android user would take a backward step to an iPhone since I will be doing the same. This is regards to that 22% of Android users might switch. Yes, the Android phone is much better for geeks like us in what you can accomplish. Taking a photo, it can be shared with any installed app that can handle it. However, the busy professional side of me misses a device that is stable and doesn't need me to waste time daily on things that don't work smoothly. Whether my carrier's stock ROM or custom ROMs I have tried, my Android device crashes at least once per day. This was not the case with my iPhone. Yes, on an Android you can attach a photo to your email even after you start writing the message, but without a third-party app and extra steps, that photo cannot be compressed. Lastly, you can count on the iPhone to feel solid and like something of value. Samsung feels junky because of its choice of materials and finish, and like a fine car, Apple has resale value at trade-in. Just check out Gazelle and see the iPhone 4S is still worth a few hundred dollars, and my old Samsung Galaxy Note is worth 26 bucks. Uh, so... Now, obviously, a lot of Android fans out there are immediately want, going to want to answer this, but I thought it was an interesting perspective of someone who's not just an iPhone user saying, well, here's why Android people should come, but somebody who's an Android user. Yeah. I mean, well, okay, so he has a Galaxy Note, right? And yeah. I don't know if Notes are necessarily Original. prone to uh, crashing once a day, but I will say that having your phone crash once a day, I'm not really quite sure exactly what that means, but that's pretty serious if that's happening and not necessarily normal. Could be a bum phone. I don't know. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Renee, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I went through the exact same thing. I, I had phones since they 
first came out, Trio 600s and Windows mobile phones. And I think it's a natural progression. It's certain people just want to be able to tinker and do anything they want with their phone. And other people just want the 80% of the stuff that they do to work 80% of the time. And I think that's the divide. Apple never made the iPhone for geeks or nerds. They made it for mainstream. They wanted to take the smartphone you know, to your mom, to, to younger people. And that's who they target. And if other people want to have a more hacky, more tweaky experience, Android is absolutely the way to go. Yep. I think you're right. Well, thanks, everybody, for submitting stories at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, place to go to let us know what stories you like, what stories you want us to talk about each and every day. We uh, consider that when we make our lineup each day. And thank you, uh, Renee Ritchie. Always good to have you on the show, man. Let folks know about imore.com, what's going on over there. Uh, we'll be covering as much as we can about iOS 6 and the iPhone 5. You can find us at imore.com. You can find me at Renee Ritchie. That's it for this edition of Tech News Today. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, tnt at twit.tv. And give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. Tomorrow is Friday, which means we'll have Darren Kitchen on the show. We'll see you then.